Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, developer of Academy, Dremio, and welcome to video number two when it comes to uh, working with Apache Iceberg. So in the first video, we set up our environment, and one of the containers that we set up was this Jupyter uh, notebook environment, okay? So assuming that you're on this page from our previous video, okay, what we want to do is create a new notebook, okay? So the create notebook, so that way they can be saved between uh, usages of the setup, I we did map this notebooks folder to the notebooks folder inside the repository. So you'll see that if I go to docker compose.yaml here, we use this volumes feature in docker. And so essentially any notebooks you create will be saved in this notebooks folder will be saved there even after you shut down this environment. So that way you have them for, for reference. Okay, and then also there'll be this lesson code folder um, that'll be available to you with actual like any any particularly for PySpark, any code that I use in these lessons, so that way you have it there for reference. Um, and if you want to copy and paste it or just look at it. Okay, and basically what we're going to do is create a new notebook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside the notebooks folder and I am going to create a new notebook. I just click on new and that's going to create the new notebook. Okay, and we just write lesson, uh, well, not right there. I'm going to click right over here and rename this like lesson one. Okay, and if you ever head over to the le in the lesson code and you go to lesson one.md, you'll find the code for this particular lesson, which we'll go over. So I'm just gonna, we're just gonna plop that right in there and then we'll kind of walk through it line by line. I'll just hit control C, why not? Tried and true. Okay, and then we'll just plop that right in there. Okay, and let's just kind of walk through the code uh, before we run it. Okay, so essentially what's happening in here is you're just importing our library. So we're importing PySpark because we're going to be working with Spark. So PySpark is the Python way of sending instructions to a Spark cluster. A Spark cluster really natively runs sort of Java Scala. So generally you can natively just create jars via Java or Scala and send them over there as Spark jobs. But essentially what Python does, it has like this Python interface where basically you can take those scripts and it'll translate them into the appropriate sort of Java Scala instructions under the hood. So that way you can uh, use a more intuitive sort of Python interface. Okay, uh, PySpark SQL. So this is, this is just the method that's gonna allow us to send SQL statements over to PySpark. And OS is just for us to access environmental variables, which I'm not accessing any in this particular script, but oftentimes you may want to define some of these variables in your environmental variables. Uh, and you would use the OS uh, built-in library in, in Python to access those variables. But these are the variables that do matter for me. So I'm gonna have my Nessie URL. Okay, so notice it's HTTP Nessie. So how does like Nessie get its own domain name? Well, when you're using Docker Compose, okay, so go back, going back to the Compose file, okay, each container is gonna be accessible to each other via like a domain name based on their container name. Okay, so Nessie is Nessie, uh, Minio is Minio, uh, Dremio is Dremio, because we named them that. We have the container name that specifies that. So in that case, since this container that's running this PySpark is on the same Docker network as the Minio and Nessie container, I can use those relative URLs. So I can say, hey, okay, Nessie is running on this URL. And then this is the endpoint for the API. And for Spark, we're gonna to wanna to use the, the V, the version one of the API for Spark. Okay, because Nessie has a V2 and a V1. You'll see later on when we use Dremio, we're gonna to wanna to use V2. Okay, eventually probably you're gonna be just using V2 for both. But at the current moment, today on August 21st, 2023, uh, that is the current state of things. Okay, so when you're reading these like configuration, because this is always one of the trickiest things when you're trying to set up Iceberg with Spark, it's just kind of knowing how do I configure Iceberg in the first place? Um, bottom line is this, just like Spark just needs to know what the Iceberg catalog is. So basically where is the listing of tables? And essentially through these configurations, we can specify, hey, what is our catalog? So this first heading is just making sure that those libraries are present. So if I don't actually have all the Iceberg Java libraries present on my computer to begin with, this packages setting, so each each of these set commands is actually setting this setting to this value, I can list all the jars or Java uh, jars that need to be downloaded from the Maven repository uh, here. Okay, so specifically we're here we have, we're, we're installing Iceberg. Okay, so it's the Iceberg library version 1.31. Okay, so basically whenever you read like the name of the Iceberg library, this tells you which version of Spark you're using. Well, this tells you what version of Spark, 3.3. .3. This tells you which version of Scala you're using, 2.12. Okay, and then this tells you which version of Iceberg you're using. 
And then we have the project Nessie jar, which is going to allow us to use the project Nessie SQL. Okay, we're using Nessie 6. Point, version 6.7. So if we have a newer version of Nessie, you just change that number. And then we have the AWS uh, bundles. This is going to allow us to write to object storage like Minio. Okay, so that's what those libraries are for. Then we have this S Spark SQL uh, extensions property. This is what this is doing is setting up all the special SQL syntax for Iceberg and Nessie. So you see here, there's two settings here, one for Iceberg and another one for Nessie. And that's just going to add all the special SQL commands that are there for those two libraries. This is the actual configuration of the catalog. So notice that I get to give the catalog a name. So spark.sql.catalog in the part after catalog is what I call the catalog. Okay, so keep in mind, I can change that. It doesn't have to be Nessie. I could call, call it cheese for all I care, long as I set up all the settings under the same namespace for that catalog to have all the information Spark needs to be able to interact with that catalog. So basically what I'm saying is like, hey, this is an iceberg Spark catalog. I'm pointing to the URL where my Nessie server is at. So that's what this we defined up here. Okay, now Nessie again has like Git features. So you're allowed to have like multiple branches, kind of like Git. Um, so you can actually specify, hey, what branch should Spark assume as a default branch during the Spark session? So in this case, main. Generally, main is your only branch unless you created other branches. Now, here you can specify the authentication. Nessie has three levels of authentication. It has um, none, which means there's just no authentication, which is what the Docker container will do out of the box. It, it has token-based authentication using open ID servers, okay, and AWS-based authentication. I think that's if you deploy um, Nessie as like a Lambda, I think that's an option. And then in that case, it'll use your AWS credentials as authentication. Okay. Um, but we're just using the Docker container and we're not changing any of the authentication settings. So it's just a straight up none. So we don't have to provide any special credentials. If we were using token base auth, we would then have to add another property called like Nessie.authentication.token where we'd pass our token. Okay. Uh, then we're specifying the catalog class. So every catalog, every category catalog with this JDBC catalog, REST catalog, um, Hive catalog, AWS Glue catalog, they all have a class in the Iceberg library or in another library. And you want to specify that class because that's going to specify how to handle certain operations when you're using that specific catalog. Okay, then the warehouse, okay, even though I put that there twice, okay, um, that shouldn't be that. Oh, okay, I know what I gotta do. Okay, one moment. Let me just copy that because I did change that setting before. Let me just copy how uh, that here. I just gotta make sure I change that in the sample code. Okay, and this should be that. Okay, so let me just line that up. Okay, but the warehouse setting, when I create a table, Spark doesn't necessarily know where you want to write the data files and the metadata files because your catalog isn't your storage. Your catalog is just a, a reference point saying, Think of it as kind of like DNS for domain names, where your website works on some server somewhere, but to figure out, hey, which computer has your dom your particular website, it has to go through DNS, which maps all domains to IP addresses. In this case, it maps all tables to a location of metadata in some storage somewhere. So <clears throat> that's great. The catalog helps Spark discover your tables, but also needs to know, hey, where should I actually write the actual data? So that's what the warehouse is for. So in this case, we're saying, hey, in our bucket called warehouse, which we should have created in the previous video, that's where we want to save it in our Minio. And it knows to use Minio, not AWS, because we're going to change the S3 endpoint. So when it makes those S3 API calls, instead of making them to AWS, it's going to make them to our Minio server running here. Because again, we can use that namespace from our Docker, uh, our Docker container. Okay, and then here, um, we specify that, hey, when you do reading and writing, we're using specifically an S3 file, uh, an S3 compliant file storage, because by default, it's just going to use normal file system IO operations, which was referred to as sort of a, uh, the Hadoop uh, version of that class, um, which is not what we want to use since we're using Minio. If you were just using your raw file storage, you wouldn't even need to specify the setting because by default, it's going to use that normal file system setting. Um, cool. So that's that configures that Nessie catalog. And then here I'm just passing uh, my Minio access key and secret key. So in your Minio, you're going to want to make sure you generate that. So I'll, I'll click back over to Minio. And to do that, you're going to click over here where it says access keys. And then you're going to click create access key. And then that's going to give you an access key and secret key, which you'll put in your settings. And then you'll hit create to make sure that it's actually created. And then it's listed there. And then you'll use that in the script. 
Okay, and that's going to allow it to have the author the authority to actually go right to Minio. Okay, this just starts our Spark session. Okay, so basically think of Spark. Essentially, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm going to do some work. I'm starting a session. So I'm going to give you some instructions during the session. So this set up the configurations for that session. Okay, so those configurations only apply during the life of this particular Spark session. And then any other Spark sessions I start up, I have to reconfigure it. Um, and here we're starting that session. And then I can start using Spark to SQL to start sending SQL. So you can see here, when you're right, when you're creating iceberg tables, you have to use the full namespace. So you have to start with the name of the catalog, and then you can say, okay, dot whatever table. Okay, so I'm going to create a table, if not exist, standard SQL. This is not an SQL course, so I'm not going to necessarily go over every bit of SQL syntax. But notice in Spark, we have to use this using iceberg feature, because Spark can use all sorts of different table formats and write to all sorts of different table formats, and not table formats, like Parquet. So it needs to know sort of like, hey, what approach do you want me to take to writing this table? In this case, I wanted to use the iceberg, set it in the iceberg format. So that's what that using iceberg clause is doing. So this creates the table. Okay, here we're going to insert a single value. This is this is just for me to test out to make sure that the catalog is working. Okay, and then we're just going to run a query in that table just to make sure that, hey, oh, this is all working. Okay. Now, then what's going to happen is that what I want to do here is I want to ingest data. You might be ingesting data from streams. You might be ingesting batch data from all sorts of different places. Here, we're going to use a very simple example that, and again, it, you know, Spark allows you to kind of grab data from anywhere and you put it into a data frame. The end goal really is just to load the data into a data frame of some sort in Spark, wherever that data is coming from. In this case, a CSV file. So right here, I'm reading the CSV file from those data, that data set that we got from Kaggle. Okay. And then I'm taking that data frame and turning it into a temp view. This creates it into an SQL view that I can reference in SQL. From there, I can actually then use it to turn that data frame into a iceberg table by using a CTAS statement or a create table as. So I'm saying, hey, create this table if it doesn't exist, okay, using iceberg. So we're using that using iceberg clause. And I'm using as to say, hey, take the results of this query. And that should be what this table looks like. Okay, and basically, I'm just taking that data frame as it is and turning it into a table. And then here, we're going to go query that table. Okay, so if I run this, okay, it's going to take a second. It's going to start start Spark up. Spark's going to download the library. So if it's the first time you're running it, it's going to take a second to download all those libraries. Once it downloads all those libraries and configures the session, it's going to start uh, doing the other things. Okay, so give it a moment. So it's running, it's running, it's running. It's going through each of the things. Do, 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 do. So right there, it created, it did the test create. Now there, it did the test insert. And then here, we're doing the query of the test table. So I can see that, hey, that value we entered into the test table works. So that means it can query the iceberg table. So good output. Okay, here's creating the actual table from the CSV file and then querying the table from the CSV file. And we can see that, hey, that was successful. Okay, wonderful. That's it. That's all it took to ingest data into Iceberg. We just get the data from wherever it's coming from into a data frame in Spark. And then we can just use a CTAS statement to go from there. Now, just to confirm that the data is actually there, let's head over to Minio. I can go over to my object browser. And you can see here in Warehouse, there's now 18 objects in here. So if we explore in here, okay, I'm going to see that Okay, here's the, the, the open table, here's a test table. And if you click on any table, the way it sets up the metadata is it puts the data in the data folder. So here's all my parquet files with the data of the table. Okay, and then here is the metadata, okay, that, that basically defines that table. Okay, so that's essentially how that works. I'll see you guys in the next video. We'll do some more other cool operations from there. I'll see you in a sec.